Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to John chapter 20. But I want to bring a message to you this morning. I have dealt with, and I know that many of you in this place are still dealing with, and that is doubt. And I want to take time this morning to dismantle doubt. Now, in the beginning of his life, H.G. Wells had an incredibly positive point of view of mankind. His early writings contained the belief that said, our race will move, will more than realize our boldest imaginations. He believed peace and unity were forthcoming. Yeah. He envisioned a utopian world. But by World War I, his philosophy of optimism was punctured yeah. like a pin punctures a balloon. Yes. Now, especially after the beginning of World War II, his writings became dark, dismal, and very discouraging. Doubt and despair had set in over his writings. And as he came to the end of his life, he could hardly remember that he had ever been such a positive thinker. You see, whether you are a saint or a sinner, doubt has a way of coming in like cloudy skies over a bright sunny day. Those rainy day blues seem to set in and at the time seems as if they are set to stay. Doubt carries the idea of uncertainty, a lack of firm conviction. Doubt can come in at any point in time in our life. To doubt then is to be human. When we read the Bible, we don't have to go too far before we run right into men, some of the greatest men of the Bible that have run into doubt at a crossroads in their life. That's right. Moses was one. Moses questioned God. In Exodus chapter 3 verse 11, but Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt? Moses from the very beginning questioned his call. Jeremiah doubted his purpose. In Jeremiah 20 verse 14 he says, Cursed be the day in which I was born. Let the day not be blessed in which my mother bore me. Understand this. Jeremiah in prison, believed that he was not to be born. He believed in his heart, I doubt my ministry, I doubt if anything's going to happen, why am I here? He was flooded with doubt. And we come quickly to the New Testament. We look at a man by the name of John the Baptist. Now would any of us ever consider John the Baptist to be a doubter? Well, the Bible does. He proclaimed the Messiah in compelling sermons in Matthew chapter 3. Yes. But by Matthew chapter 11, he's under arrest of Herod. He's found himself pondering deeply and darkly the doubting question of who was the Christ. Yeah, in Matthew 11 and 3, he sends his disciples to Jesus with a question, Are you the coming one or do we look for another? Yes. John had been in the wilderness preaching his heart out, proclaiming the coming of the liver. John saw the supernatural power of the dove descending upon Jesus. And as the voice claims that this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. But by now, away from the crowds, the river baptisms, within the confines of a dark prison cell, nothing seemed the same. John can't help but ask the questions straight out. Are you the one or do we look for another? That's right. Maybe he thought that there was still more that he had to do or that he should be doing. If this kind of doubt can happen to these great men of the Bible, then none of us are exempt. That's right. Amen. I was raised in a wonderful Christian home, but I have wrestled with my share of doubt. I'm not exempt from those doubts. And like so many others, that have had those dark days come in. And it seems as if doubt is almost a rite of passage for a child of God to move through. I know that God understands our difficulty. He's far more pleased when we ask the questions and challenge the assumptions than just to blindly accept what others told us to be the truth. My Bible tells me to work out my own salvation with fear and trembling. And will whatever might 
require to nurture my soul, my personal, authentic relationship with Jesus Christ. Yes. Now, I hope that as we dismantle doubt and we examine it, that you will see today that doubt in and of itself is not a sin. Doubt is not unbelief. Doubt asks the questions where unbelief refuses to hear the answer. Yes. The former is hard miles on a, on a good journey. The latter is a dead end, a refusal to yes. travel any further. Amen. And I also hope that before this sermon is over today, that you will see that doubt is not the opposite of faith, but the opportunity of faith. The growing pains of an eager, seeking soul searching for truth. Amen. The true enemy of faith is unbelief which refuses to consider the truth. But doubt is a necessary leg of a spiritual journey. It stands at the edge of the past, understandings, and stretches painfully towards new horizons. Right. Now let's look, if we would, at John chapter 20. Let's look at verse 24. Now I want to bring us to a point in time that I believe is when we think about doubt, this is the man that pops into everybody's head. Yes. A man by the name of Thomas, also known as Doubting Thomas. Yes. But we're going to take a real good look at his life, and we're going to dismantle his doubt a little bit. We're going to try to understand what happened here. Now, verse 24 says, Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Unless I see his hands and the mark of the nails and place my finger and the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will not believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands, yes. and put your hand and place it into my side. Yes. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Would you bow your heads? Yes. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask you, Lord Jesus, today to open up our hearts, Amen. to open up our minds, that we might be able to understand your word, you that your Holy Spirit might yes. gather our knowledge, and show us what doubt is inside of us, what doubt, what questions. And give us the opportunity, Lord Jesus, to understand your word so we may proclaim your word. Move beyond our doubts and conquer those with your truth in your word. And we ask this all in the precious name of Jesus. And everybody in the house said, Amen. Amen. Yes. We've read... That now Thomas, called one of the twins, one of the twelve, was not with Jesus when he came to see the disciples. Yes. The other, all of the other disciples were there, minus Thomas. Now one of the most important aspects of this is about doubt, is that doubt develops in isolation. Yes. Now Thomas had missed out on the celebration. Jesus appeared in the midst of all of the disciples and showed his wounds and pointed them to a brighter future. Yes. Great joy and elation, I'm sure, began to transpire and happen at that moment. Yes. I can hear him now. Jesus is alive. Can it be true? Yes. yes. He's right here in front of us. Amen. None of them had to doubt because Jesus was there. Yes. Come on. But Thomas was not. Right. And this is a very significant point. The passage is set up just like today when someone dear to us dies. We rendezvous at somebody's house, we bring food, and we console one another. Solitude isn't recommended, but Thomas, the independent thinker that he was, had drawn apart and missed out not only the consolation, yeah. but also on the miracle of the risen Savior right there with them. Yeah. Right. Doubt flourishes especially in dark, solitary confinement. The dark, the loneliness of the human spirit. In solitude, the questions seem larger, more hopeless. Where was John the Baptist when he began to question the very content of his own preaching? 
Where was John the Baptist? He was in a dark cell away from fellowship. Right. Darkness may fuel our doubts, but daylight has a way of dispelling the worst of them. Right. You know, C.S. Lewis admitted to struggling with doubt when he was on the road and some of the inns are a strange bed. He said that he loved his home and his circle of friends and his family and absent often brought on this fit of soul searching. Stay connected to people and you're more than likely to stay connected to your faith. Yes. Doubt was not just what fueled in isolation, but let me tell you this about doubt. It gives you a voice. The question about doubt then is burden of proof. Doubt not only develops in isolation, doubt demands proof. Right. Doubt asks the questions. When Thomas arrived to hear the news, his isolation had taken its toll. He says that in verse 25, The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. Yes. So he said to them, Unless I see his hands and I see his side, I will not believe. True doubt never turns away from the facts wherever they may lead. Yes. It stubbornly pursues the truth. It's Galileo's questioning that the world is flat. It's Chuck Yeager insisting that the sound barrier is no barrier at all. And Thomas here requiring a handling of the evidence. Let's consider the doubter's point of view here. When Jesus had drawn up the group's itinerary, for heading to Jerusalem, Thomas spoke up and he said this, we don't need to go. As he saw things, it would be simply too dangerous of a place for them to go. Right. That Jesus would more than likely die and possibly even us with him. Surely enough, his direst predictions for Jesus had come true. If they had only listened to Thomas, right. the master of the worst case scenario, you know, skeptics draw a melancholy satisfaction from the words, I told you so. That's right. Now, when the disciples are trying to tell Thomas the good news, yes. how does Thomas respond? Just exactly as most skeptics would. I believe it when I see it. I believe it when I feel it. And just as we love chastising Peter, for failing to walk on the water. Yes. Regardless of whether we would have ever got out of the boat or not, yes. Yes. we are all too ready to condemn Thomas here simply because he insisted on evidence. That's right. If nothing more, at least he was honest. That's right. At least he was honest. He never ruled out a miracle. He simply wanted to test the evidence himself personally. That's right. And as we'll see, Jesus met Thomas at the point of his question. That's right. Oh. It's not a true seeker if we only have doubts, but we never ask the questions, or we never make the statements of what is doubt within us. But what does it do to our faith? Doubt deepens our faith. Come on. Consider this. In the years to come, when the disciples' most definitive testimony of all, who was it? Who had the most definitive testimony of them all? Who, according to this passage, was the only one to touch his side That's right. and to put his finger through oh. the holes That's right. of the nail-scarred hands? Thomas. I can tell you that Thomas knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus was there. He saw his hands and he saw yes. his feet. Glory. If you only reach out in touch. Think about it. Jacob was brass enough to wrestle with an angel right. and the angel wrestled back. Yes. God is big enough to handle the questions that trouble you. Yes. Yes. Just be honest about your doubts. The Bible doesn't affirm doubts you keep in the box on the shelf unused and unexamined. Doubts are useless in and of themselves and are useless when they lead us to nowhere. That's right. When we don't ask the questions, our doubts stay with us yes. as comfort in our loneliness. Doubts bring us to belief or unbelief. That's right. Doubts ask us to prove the question. Yes. Don't block out your doubts, but examine them. 
Turn them around in your mind. Discuss them with wise individuals. Have the courage to face your struggling convictions. God has outlasted thousands of years of champion doubters. He hasn't heard one yet that he can't answer. And yours will not knock him off his throne. But if you hide it under the rug or in the closet, it will lurk in the back of your mind. It will collect interest until it bankrupts your faith. But doubt that is exposed can deepen your faith. Doubt that is examined can make you do something else. Doubt can help us declare our faith. When you get a question mark all straightened out, what do you have? An explanation point, right? That's right. We go from questions to proclamations. That's right. We go from unbelief to belief. And this is exactly, honest questions lead to powerful declarations. Once Thomas had answers, all he could say was, verse 28, Yes. My Lord and my God. Yes, glory. How powerful of a statement. That's right. His doubt brought him to a proclamation of definite. Yes. He went from unbelieving to believing. Yes. And it was doubt that brought him there. So many times we sit alone in our isolation, having our doubts. And we think, well, you know, I don't know. Doubt kind of sometimes closes off communication because it wants to remain in that isolation. It wants to remain unanswered. It wants you to believe that no one has the answer. And so it comforts you in the darkness. But doubt develops in isolation. And it demands proof. But it can deepen our faith and help us to declare it. So if you're ever going to dismantle your own doubts... There's some things you're going to have to do like Thomas did. You're going to have to remember a few things. And we're going to look now at how Thomas dealt with it as to how we're going to deal with it. First of all, don't keep it to yourself. Has this ever happened to you? Sliding into the pew, you're late for church. You feel tired. You're kind of cranky. And everything seems not to be going your way. Across the sanctuary, people are standing up and testifying to God's greatness. While somebody else on the other side stands up and says, Can't you just feel the sweet presence of the Lord God in this place? Everyone else is laughing and applauding and saying amen, and there you sit, full of doubt. Unable to see the presence of God. And you'd surely like to stand up and give your testimony. And if you did it, more than likely, and I'm talking about your real testimony, might sound a little something like this. Hello, everybody. Let me tell you about my morning. No, let me tell you about my week. I haven't felt anything but a lousy sinus headache and a barrel full of doubts this week. I haven't felt the presence of God in my life for a long time. I'm barely getting by at work. I have family and marital problems. And to be absolutely honest with you, I haven't seen God doing very much lately. And as you sit down, you start feeling like the gorilla at the zoo. Everybody's staring at you as you sit down. More than likely, this was the same feeling that Thomas had. As he began to hear the proclamations from all of the disciples as he walks into the room. How many have heard that song called Masquerade? We masquerade our lives in church. We put on fake smiles and we talk about how great God is. But then we leave the same way we come. Full of doubt. Full of confusion. You are not the first one to have doubt. And you will not be the last one to have doubts. But one thing about it is you cannot keep it to yourself. If you want answers and you want out of that, you have to express it. And sometimes it's not going to go over very well. But let me tell you something. Doubt that's kept in is doubt that comforts no one. Yes. Not even you. I don't know about you, but I'm not too comfortable in doubt. I want answers. But do you realize it would be far better for you to stand up and spill your wreck of a life in public than to smother your knotted up emotions in sanitary smiles 
for months and years on end. If you're going to make it through the dark times and finally encounter the true goodness of God, you must begin with honesty. You must admit to yourself that it's not well with my soul. You shouldn't keep it to yourself. But you also need to define the question. Are you struggling with salvation, resurrection, the love of God, the church, the ministry? When it comes to wrestling with the problems, there is plenty of shared knowledge that just might encourage you if you're willing to look at it. But you will have to define the doubt to dismantle it. There is nothing worse than having a bad day and not really able to put your finger on why you're having a bad day. Come on, man. It may not be the bad service that you received at the restaurant or that ice cold cup of coffee that cost you six dollars that makes you mad and makes you feel bad for the day. There is no such thing as nameless doubt. If you have doubt, write it out, and once you have defined the problem, then you can address it. Thomas may have not won an enthusiasm award that day, but kudos to him for speaking what was in his heart. Declare what you doubt and why you doubt. Define it, declare it, and Jesus will help you deal with it. That's right. Amen. He has ministers, friends, and pastors, brothers and sisters in Christ that have knowledge that may be able to help you with your doubt right. if you'll just spill it out. Yes. Amen. Come on. Yes. We seek to know the Lord. We seek the answers to all we see and touch. But for now, we must rest in the sufficiency of what is given. Yes. Someday in a better place, all questions will be accounted for. All right. tears will be dried. Yes. And all doubt will finally be laid to rest. Glory. I know in my times of doubt, I always go back and read Romans chapter 8, verse 26. And we know that all things... Yes. I love that all-encompassing. All things work together for what? Good. To those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. Yes. When in doubt, sometimes I said, I may not be able to figure this one out, but Lord, I'm still going to trust you yes. that you're in this problem of mine. Yes. So the final question about doubt is, how did Jesus respond to the doubt? And this is the part that I love. Because, you know, throughout Jesus' ministry, I can hear him time and time again talking to his disciples. And I can hear him saying the same things, O ye of little faith, for verily I say unto you, why did you doubt? Why are you not having the faith? I can see all of this taking place over and over again. Jesus is training them. He's making them and molding them. Come on. But this time, he did not say those words to Thomas. Right. No, in fact, Jesus doesn't rebuke Thomas at all. Right. He says, blessed are those who believe without seeing. But there was no formal rebuke for Thomas for his doubting faith. Yeah. His desire for Christ was to validate his claim. Yeah. Jesus appears in the room a week later That's right. and proclaims only to Thomas. Yeah. And let's look at it again. Verse 26, and after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with him. That's right. Jesus came, the door being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Yes. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here, yes. and look at my hands, and reach your hand here, That's right. and put it in my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Yes. And Thomas answered and said, My Lord and my God. He yes. could not say anything but a proclamation from a question right. of, I will not believe, to an absolute proclamation of no doubt whatsoever, this yeah. is Jesus, oh, the living yeah. Son of God. Hallelujah. That's right. yeah. But it was doubt that brought him to that proclamation. That's right. That's right. So if we see that with Thomas, what about John the Baptist? How did John the Baptist, with all of his doubt, how did Jesus respond to him? Come on. I want us to look, if we would, in Matthew chapter 11, yeah. verse 3, we see John telling his disciples to go and ask Jesus if he's the one. On. Go ask him. Come on. We're talking about the same one that baptized Jesus. Yes, that's right. That was there, that was preaching the Messiah is coming. He was yes. the one to yes. prepare the way. That's 
Right. In the prison cell, in the darkness, without fellowship, alone, in isolation, doubt comes in. And now all of a sudden, this strong man of God is doubting his own existence. He's doubting the very message that he preached himself. That's right. Yes. How did Jesus respond? Let's read. And Jesus answered them. This is John's disciples. Go and tell John what you hear and see. Yes. The blind receive the Whoa. sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, yes. and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news yes. preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Now that doesn't sound like a rebuke to me, does it? No. You know what it sounds like? It sounds like encouragement. Yes, Lord. It sounds like Jesus loved John even in the middle of his doubt. How many of us would have done the same thing? Come on. Come on. When someone's down, what do we as Christians do? What are we supposed to do? Lift them up. Well, that's exactly what Jesus does in the middle of John's doubt in prison. Yes, he did. Glory. But then you know something that's even more amazing than that? Jesus doesn't even think about his doubt. And then Jesus began to speak to the crowd concerning John. What he said. Now we're talking about the same one that just doubted Jesus. Yes. Where do we sit in our doubt? What did John the Baptist do in the middle of his isolation? He declared the question and he got an answer. That's right. Yes. He found encouragement because he had the courage to ask, even in the middle of his doubt. Yes. Thomas may have not won any awards when he really truly began to say what was in his heart. That's right. At that moment, he declared what was in his heart. Yes. He declared the questions that needed to have answers for him. He declared it. Jesus didn't rebuke Thomas. He didn't rebuke John the Baptist. And in the middle of my doubt, when I need encouragement, I know that Jesus is not going to, to rebuke me. That's right. Amen. And he's not going to rebuke you. In closing, sometimes I can't figure it all out. Sometimes I may not know exactly why I'm in the darkness. But John 10.10 10 says, The thief comes but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that you might have life and have that life more abundantly. Yeah. Yeah. Satan desires to steal your joy. Yes, he he wants to kill that joy yeah. and he wants to destroy whatever works you might do for others. Yes. If he can hinder you by telling you a lie, you'll believe he'll do it every time. That's right. Yes. But Jesus has come that you might have life and have yes. that life more abundantly. Glorious. That means it's a choice of yours whether to believe or not believe. I choose to believe Christ. Yeah. I choose to trust the word despite my doubts. Yeah. Yeah. When I have doubts, there are certain things that I've got to do. I don't want to keep them to myself. Yes. It takes that. Yeah. But if you want to be a light to the world, yeah. sometimes we're going to have to get out of that dark room. Yeah. Then right. we become the light to the world. Yeah. But how can we do that if we're living in doubt? How can we do that if we come to church with fake smiles? Doubt tries to come in and snuff out that light. But I'm so glad that Jesus, yes. in the middle of my darkness, brings the light of encouragement into my life. Glory. So as we've looked at doubt, doubt comes in various shapes and sizes at all times of our lives. Yes. But you don't need to keep it to yourself. You need to declare it, you need to define it, yes. and you need to tell someone. So it can be dealt with. Doubt is not a sin, but keeping it to yourself, it can become one.